We're really delighted to have Mary Blackwood from Sponsored Programs today. Um, Mary has done a couple of grant uh, advice, get it done sessions for us before, and we have those posted online on our YouTube site, so you can find the Oberman YouTube site. Mary has been an incredibly, incredibly supportive um, and, and professional member of the sponsored program staff and has been the beacon that helped several of us take grants home in the last 10 years. I can't say enough about how much I enjoy working with her. And Mary, thank you so much for wise and witty ways to look for funding. And we'll turn the screen over to you. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm Mary Blackwood. Hello, everybody. I can't see you. Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, I have a kind of a casual way of talking, so you'll get used to it. Um, I will leave time at the end for questions, but also please put questions in the Q&A and Teresa and Lauren may manage those. If they see something good to ask me in the middle of things, they know that that's okay or leaving them to the end. Um, I'm not the world's expert on everything, but I'll do my best and I've got them also here to help with answering. So. I am a grant reviewer in the Division of Sponsored Programs. What that means is that when grants are routed to DSP, like a grant application, I am going to review it for, for compliance issues, um, for accuracy, for following the sponsor's guidelines, for completeness, et cetera. DSP also has budget reviewers who will look at your budget and help you with uh, incorrect things there. And we just want you to submit the best possible grant application you can. Now, of course, the first thing you need to do is find somewhere to apply for money to. And I am going to share my screen. This is my, my slide program. I hope it all looks right now. Um, finding funding. Um, I, I, I am going to give credit to Teresa for Wise and Witty Ways to Search. And I, Hope I can live up to that. Uh, we're going to look at, at smaller uh, sponsors or harder to find ones so that you can get a foot in the door. I also want to say I used to have a wonderful colleague that I give talks with, Aliva Smith. She retired a year ago from DSP and just, I miss her. Uh, she had a master's in library and information science and I'm still using some of her slides. Uh, some of them are going to mention key keywords and terms in the biomedical sciences, but I'm sure you can figure out how to switch that to the humanities. But I'm also mainly focused on arts and humanities, although I think this could work for almost anybody. And also in DSP, I focus on the private foundations. So there we go. Okay, well, you know, you have an idea. You have a project you want to do. And you'd like to have a little money to help you make that happen. Um, you know, you know that the NEH is out there, the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, some other private foundations that give out 50,000, 100,000, 300,000. There's a lot of competition for those. And maybe you don't need 300,000 for your project. Maybe you need 2,000. There are so many sources out there. And you might find something with less competition so that you have a better chance of getting it. I know how nerve wracking it can be to write grants. It's very hard sometimes to get an award, but persistence will absolutely pay off. But sometimes it's finding the right sponsor to go to. I also want to make a comment about high risk projects. Uh, unless the sponsor's RFP, the request for proposals, also known as an RFA, request for applications, they go by all sorts of names. Unless they're asking for a high risk idea, don't go with a high risk idea. And I would say in the humanities, it's unlikely, I could be wrong, that there would be high risk ideas, but there could be. <laughs> but when I think of the biomedical sciences, if somebody has a crazy new idea uh, with cancer, something they could maybe try doing that would improve the life of cancer patients, there are sponsors out there who want those high risk ideas and they are willing to spend that money knowing you might not succeed, <laughs> but it will be a wonderful reward if you do. Instead, it's usually best to stay kind of in the middle of your field, <clears throat> go with what's current in your field, um, your area, except with a little twist on it, something that you specifically will look at. Maybe you're going to take some other research 
a little further with your idea. So you need something that'll catch the attention of the grant reviewers. And so you're gonna kind of follow the leaders. Maybe you've researched around on, online to see what grants are being awarded to people. You can often find lists on sponsor sites of who got awarded, the name of the project director, how much money they have been given, what the name of their project is, and maybe even an abstract. So don't duplicate what they've already awarded. On the other hand, if you're kind of in the same area as the other things they're awarding, you know you're on the right track. So time is money. This is this is on Oliva slide. Um, she she used to say, make it your job to look every single week. Maybe carve out 60 minutes max, maybe 20 minutes even, who knows? Uh, but just make it a time of the week when you look at the grant seeking and grant writing fields. Um, you want to look everywhere because there are different resources that will find different opportunities and no database finds everything. Um, I'm going to try to help you with how to find those things. Um, one thing that's great to do is make yourself a grant seeking and grant writing calendar. For example, you might find that you just missed a deadline for uh, an opportunity that seems perfect for your idea. Well, put it on your calendar for next year because most small sponsors are going to have annual opportunities. Then on the calendar, you can kind of back off and say, okay, about four months before that deadline, I'm going to start really developing my project idea better. And three to two months, I'm writing it. I'm getting feedback from colleagues. That way, you'll have a great application ready on time. You can find all sorts of in interesting information, um, not just you know grant write, grant grant uh, opportunities, but if you find organizations that have say a newsletter, sign up for it. I'm just going to say right here. I'm going to go online. This is the Archi National Archives, the National Historical Publications and Records Commission. Um, they have grant opportunities. I'm just kind of looking around here. I'm sure they've got a blog. Look at that. They've got a blog. Sign up for stuff on this kind of thing, okay? It's it's very handy because then they might announce on the blog or on the newsletter, oh, we've got an opportunity coming up, an exciting new one, and here's what it's about. Get ready. You can always look at past guidelines. Um, and in fact, if you're starting to write a grant kind of early for an opportunity, maybe before they put out their new RFP, you can get going on it by looking at the past guidelines. But always, always, always go to the most recent ones when they're available, because sponsors will tweak them, even if it's the same opportunity. They might have a, a little twist on it. Make sure you give them what they're asking for. Another thing that's great is to go find webinars or small conferences online. There's so many free ones. A lot of sponsors will have a little webinar on their upcoming opportunity. Um, they might even take questions from the audience during that about the specific opportunity. That's a great way to learn how you should focus your application. Um, you can learn a lot about grant writing from these too. Get this all on your grant calendar. That's my suggestion. Well, it was Aliva's originally and now it's mine. Okay, so we all know about the big fish out there. <laughs> um, be great to get an NEA grant, wouldn't it? Uh, Fulbright, wow, the prestigious. That's part of the Department of State. A lot of these are, are going to be federal, the ones that give out big money. There are also a lot of private foundations that give out big money as well. I mean, there's Mellon, Getty, Ford, Luce, Guggenheim, Rockefeller. There's the Lilly Endowment. Um, so they might call themselves a trust, an endowment, a foundation. The Teagle Foundation, I, I don't know how many people know about that, but it gives out sizable grants. Uh, in the humanities, uh, the American Council of Learned Societies, um, Russell Sage in social sciences. So there are all these big fish and it would be wonderful to get a grant from them. And someday you will if you keep going. But you might need to start with the small fry. And you might just need that $1,000 or $5,000. And here's the thing, less competition. Let me tell you the most recent Mellon Foundation grant I believe they had um, a funding line of 7%. That means of, of 200 plus applications that came in, they funded fewer than 20 of them. And those 200 whatever applications were all, well, most, most of them were from people who have been writing grants a long time, who have great ideas, 
well-educated, smart people just like you. Mellon has only so much funding to give out for each opportunity. And this is the same with every sponsor. So they have to turn down great projects. They have to make hard decisions and decide what to fund. And your, your thing is to be to find the thing where you fit in and your project fits in so that they're going to choose you and your project. But really with the smaller ones, you're definitely going to have less competition. You might find something that's that's really far more focused on what you're looking at. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard of silos and smokestacks. That's in Waterloo, Iowa. They do give out money. And they're about, uh, you know, farm, you know, the history of farm, uh, farms and industry, I think. Now look at that, they've got internship program awards, provides up to 75% of the wage of a college summer intern to go to a designated heritage area site. Well, if you're studying an Iowa heritage uh, area site and you want to send a college summer intern out there to do some interviewing for you, that it's, it's going to be small, award range below $3,000, but it might be exactly what you need. Um, Family foundations are, there are so many of these and they keep popping up more and more. I'll just tell you a little bit about two local ones. The Nellie Ball Trust focuses on psychiatry research. And I believe somebody in the family um, had a psychiatric condition that was devastating to them. So the family founded a trust to provide money to researchers to make this better for other people. This Nellie Ball Trust doesn't even have a website. They send out an RFP once a year to us at the University of Iowa. I assume they send them out maybe to other places, ISU, um, UNI, maybe. That's the only way we know about it, though. Uh, the Satan Foundation has actually sunsetted now, I believe. But for many years, we got plenty of money in the arts from them, especially arts education. Now, the Satan Foundation was named for Reuben and Muriel Saban, who are from San Francisco, and their son, Gene moved to Iowa City and became a faculty member in the business college here. And he's now emeritus. All their money was given out in San Francisco and Iowa City. So we got a lot of, of uh, awards from them. And again, they don't have a website either. That was, they don't do RFPs either. So family foundations can be all over the map, you know, but if you can make, um, get a, a, learn about one that's in your area and use it, that could be really great. And the Carver Trust is another local one. They fund biomedical things. They don't have RFPs. But if somebody like in microbiology wants a new fancy schmancy $800,000 um, microscope, they can ask the Carver Trust if they'll fund it. And they've funded a lot of stuff for us. Um, other state sponsors that are of interest here would be Humanities Iowa funded by the NEH and the Iowa Arts Council, which is funded by NEA, but Iowa organizations, the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs actually manages that money to hand it out. And I think their top awards are $10,000. They also have some $1,000 awards. These are easier to get, I can tell you right now. Uh, less competition and it's for people in Iowa on the whole. So they're worth trying. Don't forget your own institution. The University of Iowa has money to give out to. The Office of the Vice President for Research gives out funding for the AHI Arts and Humanities Initiative. You can just go to their website and find out about that. That's really great. Other parts of the college or the, the, uh, the university are giving out student grants, like the Gregg College might have something for grad students right now. Something I didn't know about until very recently was the UI Center for Advancement Student Impact Grant. The Center for Advancement is our foundation. They take in donations from the public and then help UI with that. So here, for example, is a student impact grant right there on the, uh, pre the president's office has allocated $7,000 per semester. We have our grant guidelines here, uh, eligibility requirements, et cetera. So you, you're gonna find this kind of stuff all over the place. Meanwhile, remember that the ocean is very large out there. Um, every year, DSP works with a, a, a large number of sponsors. In FY 
2022, faculty and students and staff submitted applications through DSP to 1,261 separate um, sponsors. Now this does include uh, sponsors for contracts as well as grants. Um, it's federal, state, private, business, et cetera. But a lot of them are grants. And in FY22, 308 of those sponsors were new to us this year. In FY 2021, our faculty and students and staff submitted 900 to 932 different uh, um, sponsors. And 235 of those sponsors were new to us that year. There's always new stuff coming out. Now, of that 932 sponsors, a lot of them are going to NIH, you know, National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, American Heart Foundation, et cetera. But a lot of the sponsors have only one application that went in for it. And people are finding new things all the time. Uh, I'm looking at like the Amy P. Goldman Fellowship in Pre-Raphaelite Studies. I found that at the Delaware Art Museum. If you are interested in something that's at their art museum and that's Pre-Raphaelite, you know, they might fund somebody from Iowa. Um, the, it's always important to find out if you're eligible, but don't assume without looking. I found the Music Man Foundation while I was helping somebody looking for music therapy um, opportunities. Um, it's based in Los Angeles, but it's named for Meredith Wilson, a native Iowan who wrote the Music Man. He also wrote um, The Unsinkable Molly Brown and other things. Uh, this one tends to, if I go to this one, it's going to say, uh, I think it says somewhere that it wants, sector makes grants. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think it was talking about being in the California area or something related to that. Now, just because you're not in California doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, if you've got something you're studying that's about music, uh, musical theater in California, there's a fun one. Another one I came across was the Arthur Flagler Fultz Research Award from the American Music Therapy Association. Another one I'd never heard of, but it was really quite right for the person I was talking with. So you can find crazy stuff out there and so much of it. And I haven't even touched it the tiniest bit. I, I did want to mention the Inatai Foundation drew my interest recently. It's about, uh, actually it's set in the state of Washington and it's mostly about uh, indigenous cultures or people of color. But notice that it says it gives awards uh, about the state of Washington and its borders. So there are a lot of state foundations that will do that. Um, the Humanities Iowa will sometimes award money to somebody in Illinois if they're doing something about the border between the states, some cultural idea, or if they're doing something, some research in Iowa. So always be aware that just because it says, you know, Washington or Illinois or Iowa doesn't mean it can't be for you to apply. Okay, there's so many other ways to search for funding. Uh, I'm gonna just show you the UI grant bulletin here. This is something that Aliva kept, Aliva Smith kept up very nicely because she had that master's in library and information science. She could really do deep dives to find things. Um, we're on a lot of listservs at DSP, so we've tried our best to keep it up to date uh, since she retired. So we've got some people adding things all the time to this. So. It can be interesting to see just the grant bulletin. All you have to do is go to the DSP homepage. There's a button for grant bulletin right there. And you can sort them. Arts and humanities. The newest ones are at the top. The newest ones we have created. You can see the sponsor deadline or sometimes a letter of intent deadline. And let's see. There are also, uh, we also have a list of UI internal funding. Um, let's see. Just kind of looking at that graduate internal fellowship deadlines. So this is what you do when you're looking for stuff. Just keep going to the internet, find just, this one's a little slow to open though. It's a PDF, ah, that's interesting. Wow, there's a lot of them, but of course some of these are 2022. Anyway, you get the point. There's a lot of stuff out there for you to look at. Google, oh my God, Google, fun, okay. So when I went to Google like a couple of days ago and I found this instrumental thing, I was looking for family foundation humanities and it 
pulled up this thing. Um, this is just some kind of list that's kept up uh, by some organization. Yes, you can. You can pay to subscribe. University of Iowa does not. Um, I don't know why it came right out in the middle. There it's that page. But if I see that's these are organizations that have about $40,000 in their bank. That's not a lot. And then you go up near the top and they've got $653 million in their bank. <laughs> that would include the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Um, if you go down a little bit more, you're going to find, you know, the Walmart Foundation, $125 million. This could be a great place to just kind of scan through and see what's there that sounds interesting. These lists are all over the internet. Inside Philanthropy Humanities Grants. This is a funny one. I go to this and then I start scrolling down and I see all these names. Oh, wow. That's really great. And then it disappears. Okay. <laughs> That's because it's another paid one. But if you just like refresh the page and you maybe, th this is what it takes to look sometimes. Oh, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, Argosy Foundation, you know, remember it and then Google it. Okay. That's what you can do with that. Uh, list, lists of grant programs in your field. Again, that some of those are some of them here and you, you can find so many more. Blogs can be an interesting place to go. A blog in your field. This is philosophy talk. And uh, it could be that somebody's doing a blog and they mention an upcoming opportunity, or they might mention a webinar that's coming up that talks about grant seeking or grant funding. You can probably sign up to be on the blog list and get their email, subscribe. These are all interesting things to do. If you look over this blog and you like what they're talking about, you might as well sign up. And there's so many of them out there. Um, now, mostly you're going to wind up going to sponsor websites. I always recommend that you read the mission statement. For example, the Russell Sage Foundation literally says that it was established by Margaret Olivia Sage for the improvement of social and living conditions in the United States. So whatever your project is, you should always meet, be sure that it fits into the um, uh, into the mission statement because they, they aren't going to fund something that doesn't. Here's another place to go. Others, other universities lists or grant bulletins. This is the University of Florida. Okay. Um, find funding, faculty. Let's see what they've got. Internal ops. Well, they're not going to give that to us. External. Um, let's see. Research. Um, postdoc fellowships. Let's see what they put in a list here if they keep it up to date. Okay, there's Mellon. Yep, Emory University. No, not good. But here's some interesting stuff. What's the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies? Uh, it's probably not in the grant bulletin. It might be something you can apply for, the Winterthur Postdoctoral Fellowship. You can find so much from other sites. And I'm going to start closing a few of these sites so it doesn't run too slow. OK, now, OK, here's another interesting one. Somebody mentioned to me recently, chat GPT. Whatever you think. Whatever you think of large language models, and I'm scared of them, frankly. Um, if it's a tool you can use, I say use it. And I think, let's see, we're gonna, I did I did create my a, a, uh, a login account recently. Go away, I don't need you. I don't remember this being there before. Okay, I'm gonna send a message here. And this is just really interesting. Um, I want a grant for theater, costuming, and grants. Now I'm gonna just see what it says. Oh, I don't have the authority to grant funds. <laughs> However, look at that. Here's a possible source. Um, the French Ministry of Culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fondation d'Entreprise Armes. I don't know. Oh, but you know what? These are probably for people who are French. Okay, let me let me. Let me grab this. I'm going, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to put as an American. Let's see what they come up with. Fulbright. Okay, that's one of the biggies. That's not a small fry. Oh, the European Cultural Foundation. Okay. Oh, NEA. You know, 
every time I redo one of these queries, it comes up with different stuff if I just reword it slightly. So it's very interesting. I've had it come up with all sorts of organizations that are just fascinating. So give, give GPT a chance. And they often have a website link. You just don't know what they'll come up with. And I'm going to log out because they scare me. Another thing you might want to do, this is from Aliva, is to you know search about sponsors too, because that'll give you the best chance of finding the one that's right for you. If you didn't know about Form 990 Finder, the Form 990 is a form that every nonprofit 501c3 files annually with the IRS, and they are public information. So you might find the names of board members there or the grants awarded. Any information that can give you a, a little bit of a leg up in um, giving them what they want to see will help you get the award. We are going to look into the pivot database, which UI does have a subscription to, and it's free to all people in the UI commu community. But first I'm gonna talk about one of um, Aliva's favorite things. She always liked to bring up a word about words. When she would do a, a bespoke uh, search for funding for a faculty member or a student or someone, she would say, don't give me keywords, give me a brief paragraph about what your project is about because she wanted to pick those keywords out herself. Use broad terms. For example, now here's where we are in the biomed world. If you wanna study molecular mechanisms behind inflammatory response, try searching for inflammation. Or if you do inflam, you'll also get inflammatory. If you need to narrow it down, um, what's causing the inflammation? Put in virus. Maybe where is it occurring? Put in lungs. What's the relevance to the broader subject area? You can also throw in heart disease, uh, immunosuppressed, et cetera. These are good ways to find words that will bring out what you want. Um, many, many sponsors are named for the area study, like the N National Endowment for the Humanities, et cetera. Um, often the private ones are named perhaps for a person like Doris Duke, the Doris Duke Foundation, but the Doris Duke Foundation has one for Islamic arts, very specific. Um, and they tend to describe themselves with the general or broad terms. Um, for example, American Heart Association, you might be studying angiotensin, but that might not be what's found if you go searching. It might want to find um, translational science or cardiovascular, um, hypertension, cardio. And then here's the Doris Duke Clinical Scientist Development Award. So that's very specific too. And it's still Doris Duke, but it's very different from Islamic arts. Um, a junior physician scientist might particularly be searching with that kind of quote because he or she is uh, early career and, and doesn't want to find things that are for senior um, researchers who have a big long track record. We're going to dive into Pivot in a moment. I'm actually going to go into Pivot. For those of you who already know about it, sorry, but I will tell you this, there's so much stuff in it. It's free to you. All faculty with a Hawk ID already have access. All you have to do is go in there. Uh, the people who help you with it are the research development office in the vice president for research's office. They offer monthly virtual online sessions. And by the way, there's one today at 2 p.m. If you wanted to go over there and just register, you can immediately start looking at you know, or getting some help from them on good ways to use Pivot. Uh, they will also help you set up a faculty profile um, that can help pivot to know when you come in that you are in the, the history field. Might make the searches go better. Pivot does find opportunities. Um, there are some instructions, and you will, by the way, be given these if you want, given these slides. So you can find the DSP website pivot user guide or on our funding databases page, more information. But right now, I'm going to show her slides, then I'm going to go in, okay? This is what it looks like when you log in. Aliva said, search by keyword. Usually, it's, it's defaulted to search all fields, which includes funder. She likes to go with search by keyword. Keyword takes advantage of the hierarchy created by the database editors. So that'll just make it work better for you. And we'll see that in a minute. Here's library science, search. That came up with 421 results back when she did this slide screenshot. Uh, that might be too many, uh, but here we've got a lot of ways on the other side to refine your search. 
you might want to see their top keywords and say, oh yeah, digital, that's what I'm doing. I'm gonna click on that and I'll have only 60 to look at. Another thing you could easily do is click on US dollars because you might assume that some in, given out in euros might be for people in Europe. You can save your searches. This is great. If you save a search and you can save many. Uh, if you save a search and then click this button, would you like to receive a weekly email? That's what's great. You have your search with all its parameters and every week you'll get an email after uh, Pivot reruns the query and gets the newest stuff. So that's a great thing to do. So also you might, another thing to remember is that sometimes for some sponsorships, you, you must have membership in the organization, whatever it is. These were just some um, library grants uh, that Aliva posted when we had this talk because it just showed, you know, there are all sorts of grants that you can find in, our, in Pivot. When I was going through with the, um, the music um, therapy person from UI, she was just quite fascinated by uh, what Pivot appeared to have. And she was just uh, really excited to get into it herself and start looking for her own stuff. And I think you'll feel the same way. So that was the quick overview. And I put this up here so I can click on it and go in. Now, oh, I'm already signed in. There is a thing where when I'm when I'm not signed in, it, it says password and that sort of thing. Let me see, maybe, maybe I should sign out, but maybe I shouldn't. I'm gonna sign out to show you what it looks like. See here? Okay, let me do wait, let me go here again. When I'm not signed in. I'll go sign in, access via my institution login. I don't use a username or password. I click here and it's going to say, I picked University of Iowa and it's going to use my Hawk ID. It took me a few times to find that little space there. So here we are, let's, let's search something by keyword, okay? Um, ooh, here about, Tang Dynasty Rands. Oh, it brought natural and physical sciences, math and technology. No, that doesn't seem right. Hmm, let me try that again. Oh, let's try, let's try. Well, how about this one? Philosophy of language. Now I should be able to put another term in there too, but I've had a little bit of trouble with that. Like what if we said Korean? Okay, Korean language or literature. I've got two things here I'm going to search. 31 results. Canada, New South Wales, Korea. Oh, the Korea Foundation does fund things in the United States. I know that because we have some. Uh, or do we have the Korea Foundation? Um, I'm going to go to, oh, look, there are 10 of them in US dollars. Let's, let's sort by that. The Korea Foundation, support for libraries with Korean collections. I think we get $5,000 a year from them. Um, let's look, what else What else they have? Graduate studies. So we're still in Pivot and it tells us the kind of organization it is. 150 scholarships are available. Um, eligibility, ME or PhD, currently enrolled in grad programs at a university located outside Korea and focusing on a career related topic in the humanities, et cetera. Uh, so then you can go to the actual website for that, um, which is right up here to apply. So you can see that Pivot has just enormous amounts of information. Um, if you go back to funding and go search by keyword, I don't think it's remembering it anymore. So I think I can start a new one. Anthropology, let's say cultural anthropology. How about indigenous peoples search? 230 results. By the way, I can also uh, limit it to confirmed uh, or I could look at anticipated, but right now I want to see the confirmed deadlines. And then I've got 78 results. Well, I'm just gonna go to USD because it'll take it down to 26. Doesn't mean you should always go for the ones in US dollars. But here we have the National Science Foundation, the American Anthropological Asso Association. Um, 
let's see, the Wenner-Gren Foundation for Anthropological Research. It's got so much information. So basically, as we said, that was a quick overview of Pivot Search by Keyword. And I hope you all go and check it out. Now, again, here are some lists, blogs, et cetera. I've just put these in here for you. Um, Humanities for All blog, Talking Humanities Archive, Artwork Archive. Uh, here's um, the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, Humanities, Grants, Programs. You might also find some program about uh, like a webinar on how to write the grant for Humanities Iowa. So always be looking for these places where you can um, find or, or connect with other uh, scholars in your field who are kind of maybe even bringing each other up to date on what's out there. And this also helps you know what's current in your field. I mean, you know anyway, because you're studying it, but it might say what's getting funded right now. The whole point of what you're doing here is of course to, um, to find those small opportunities, right? And by the way, who else can help you? Well, there's me. Up to the end of this year, I will be here. You can write to me, just email me. You can find my phone number and call me and just say, hey, could you just spend some time with me uh, looking into opportunities for um, you know, my project and give me a dis you know, you could give me a description of it. I'll tell you that. I believe and I used to sit with a lot of people, a lot of faculty members and do it together. That was great, but I can still do that to help you. Um, even once I'm not around, you could always send an email to dsp at uiowa.edu and ask the person uh, who was, you know, the, the, the dear DSP. I was going to say if you were on the phone, you could ask them in person. But there are people at DSP who specialize in all sorts of grants. Um, there are people who do the NIH and the NSF. There are people who do um, clinical trials for drug studies, et cetera, people who specialize in arts and humanities. And when you go to dsp at uiowa.edu, they're going to know whom to send you on to. So we'll try to help you whenever we can. Another great resource is the Research Development Office. It was actually set up to uh, especially work on large interdisciplinary grants that could be established at the University of Iowa. A grant applications that could be created and then if funded, you know, would bring more prestige to U of Iowa and bring in some money. But they'll also help you with smaller things when they have time for that too. And they are also are the go-to uh, people for Pivot if you have questions about Pivot. So never hesitate to go there. And another absolutely wonderful resource when you if you find a sponsor that's of interest to you. You can call them and ask to speak to a program officer. Say you see something like two months from now, um, they're going to have a, a particular grant opportunity that's of interest to you, but you're not sure that your project really fits into it. Pick up the phone, call them and ask to speak to the program officer for it. A lot of them will. I mean, I can tell you a story about a time I did that. I uh, Once upon a time, I uh, created and managed a small film festival and I wrote a grant to the Iowa Arts Council. And I followed the instructions very, very closely. I looked at their rubric. I made sure I you know, touched everything on every point they wanted. I thought I wrote a really great grant. you know. And they, they, they do have competition, but less than some big one might. Well, I submitted it and it was denied. They did send reviewer comment, comments, anonymous ones. And they sent something about the rubric that showed where I had maybe not gotten a high score. So I figured I'm going to call the program officer and talk about it. I picked up the phone and I asked for this person. I knew she'd been there for many years. And uh, she picked up the phone. And I said, hi, I'm Mary Blackwood. And I'm with the film festival. I submitted a grant and it was denied. And she said, oh, OK. And I could almost hear a little hesitation in her voice. She was thinking maybe that she was about to get yelled at. Believe it or not, there are people who say, why didn't you fund my grant? Um, that's not what I did. I said, I just want to say thanks for having the grants available and for reviewing my grant. And thank you also for sending those reviewer comments. Now, I wonder if I could just get some information or some advice from you about what those comments meant so that I can make a stronger grant next time. And then she just opened up and we had a wonderful conversation. 
She helped me to try to interpret what they wanted because she's been there so long and she'd seen a lot of grants come through. Um, you know, every time they had a review committee, it can be a different committee, but still, she knew uh, what was coming over the transom. She knew what got funded and uh, gave me great advice. And the next time I submitted to the Iowa Arts Council, I got a grant. So always, always remember with any time you talk with grants people, um, a sponsor, they spend a lot of time putting together their RFPs. They spend a lot of time running the review committees. Um, they are giving away free money and they're putting in so much work to do it so that respect them and respect their process. It's just so important. Now you're still thinking, what are your chances? I say it's always worth applying. Um, you're going to get practice at grant writing. You're going to get practice at grant seeking. Every time you write one, even if it's turned down, you're getting more and more practice. You're getting feedback from your colleagues. This is worth it. You are going to get there sometime. Persistence will pay off. And furthermore, a track record of small awards that you've received are going to look very, is going to look very good to a major funder later. Uh, sponsors are all looking for someone who can fulfill the project that they said they were going to do because sponsors can then use it in their publicity to see, say, look what we're doing. They can take that back to their donor base and say, look at this project we funded by somebody at the University of Iowa and they finished it and they produced this. It's wonderful. If you donate more money to us, we can fund more of these. So they love to know that you can get something done. So it's worth it just for the track record, if nothing else. And now I'll just ask you for questions. Do you have roadblocks you're thinking of? And I see we have some, uh, some questions perhaps. And I'm going to, why don't I stop sharing? Uh, <clears throat> so somebody can ask me questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Mary. I am not seeing questions right now, which I might be overlooking, but I, um, yes, the slides will be available. We, we're recording and we'll have this on the Oberman YouTube site uh, so you can share with people. I just wanted to, to reiterate what Mary said about building a record of succeeding with grants. And one of the other areas um, that I think I've seen a lot of graduate students as well as faculty be successful is library grants. Mm -hmm. So most of the major, the libraries that have major collections like the Newberry in Chicago or the Harry Ransom in Texas or nearby at Indiana, the amazing Lilly Library, they almost all give three or $4,000 grants that let you come over and spend a month or three weeks or whatever, and do research and have amazing collections. And as Mary was suggesting, that's another of those spaces where you have to do some digging to make sure you know what their strong collections are uh, relative to fields you're working in. But that can be a heavenly way. And part of what to, to get a, your, an early grant Part of what's wonderful about those is you show up at a special collections library, they've read your application, they have pulled materials for you. I've never felt so pampered in my life as when I've been at, at the Harry Ransom or the Lily. And so, um, so there are these whole tiers of grants that, and foundations that, as Mary suggested, I think once, once you find out that kind of within that sphere, your sort of work has some capital, then it helps you to narrow down this huge uh, array. But so does so does um, Pivot, and Pivot does a lot. Are there other questions people have, or even if they're, we've got about 10 minutes, even if there are specific topics you're working on that you'd like Mary's advice about keywords, feel free to drop those in Q&A too. Oh, go ahead, Lauren. It does look like we have a question in the chat for, or in the Q&A that's uh, asking, how do you suggest trying to get a phone meeting with a program officer who's often hard to get a response from? That's a very good question. Um, it's true that the Iowa Arts Council is a smaller organization. You know, sometimes what you can do is you can come to somebody like me, like if you want to talk with, I don't know, people from... I don't, even the Department of State talk about tough. Okay, sorry, maybe that's too tough. Let's say the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Arts. 
Um, if you reach out to me and say, I've got a great project and I'd like to learn more about this opportunity, then me that what I can do as a, a, a DSP person and anybody in DSP can do this um, is I can write to the grants organization and I've got this nice little signature thing that says I'm um, authorized to act on behalf of our vice president for research, J. Martin Schultz. Sometimes they'll pay more attention to that. And I'll just say, dear foundation, um, I've got a faculty member here who really would love to submit to your organization, but they have some questions about this. May I hook them up with you in some way? Can they call you to ask direct questions about their project? That can be one way. You know, you just have to try. It's true. Some of them get so many calls that they're going to try to push you off, right? But if you can use DSP or leverage us to get to them, we're happy to help. All right, thanks. We have another one that's asking, is Pivot available to UI students? Yes, it's available to anyone. I, my understanding to the entire you know, University of Iowa community, my understanding is that the faculty automatically have something set up for them. Um, a student, you might have to reach out to RDO, the Research Development Office, to get that set up. But I'm a staff member and I had to get set up at one point in it. Uh, it's just that that it's automatic for the faculty. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then another one's asking, is it appropriate to apply for several grants simultaneously? For example, NEH fellowship and ACLS. You know, it can be. That's a tricky situation, but you have to pay attention to the guide, the guidelines. The guidelines might say you cannot have two uh, grants at the same time to fund the same project or the project with overlap. So they might still say you can apply, but what if you got both of the grants and you know one of them maybe a month after the other or something, you're lucky if they're really close together so you can make a decision. You're lucky if you get two grants <laughs> awarded, right? But you may have to turn one of them down. So I would say think really hard too, because I sure wouldn't want to go tell NEH, um, I'm going to have to turn down your grant because I got a better one. So a lot of people won't want that, but it is done. It's definitely done. And there are people who've gotten two grants and they've had to turn one down. So I think unless they say don't do this and they might in the guidelines, I'd say it's okay. But Teresa might have other ideas about that from her long time at the Oberman Center. <laughs> No, I, I mean, and there are other people on the call who've had many large grants too, I know, but um, I, I do feel like the chances are such that if I had two a, a project that I thought spoke well to both ACLS and NEH, I think I would take the chance. Um, and, and I think the grant officers are understanding about the fact that people are having to look in this way. Mm -hmm. So... I guess, yeah, I, I would say I think Mary's caution is good caution, but just as it used to be completely frowned upon to send a manuscript to two presses, and that seems to be much more acceptable now, there seems to be more flexibility in these in these areas. And, and so often these grants, the opportunities will come around once a year, and, and if exactly. you're really right now, it would be sad to not apply for both because you might get one and not the other, but you don't know which. And ACLS in particular has been very experimental in the last few years. So sometimes they run a grant for two years mm -hmm. and then it disappears. Mm -hmm. So that's another good point, Mary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions or advice that people who are listening have, we'd be, we welcome your advice or foundations or other funding sources that you've, you've been fortunate enough to be funded by. So feel free to share as well as ask questions. Um, I will say that, as I mentioned at the beginning, Mary has done another workshop for us um, uh, at Overman, and uh, we have a couple of Chrissy Fitzpatrick, who used to be it with class, has also done a workshop for us. And we have a link, I think, to a fabulous workshop that a consortium partner, uh, Bill Hart Davidson from Michigan State, he has given, he has produced several wonderful videos that we can share, but that are on the Humanities Without Walls website, which is a big Mellon funded project we're part of. Um, and I strongly, I think he gives some of the best concrete advice about grant writing I've ever seen. Very thoughtful and smart and broken down into to just great concrete 
bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. So there are opportunities out there. I think one of the things that I can imagine with what you've just heard from Mary is it can seem that there's so much that trying to thread the needle seems kind of overwhelming, but that's where starting with pivot could be a great, a great way to get in deeper into the variety of opportunities that then might lead you out to other places. That would be one way to corral that multiplicity of a little bit. Mm -hmm. And Pivot does have an awful lot of opportunities. I Somebody did find something that I looked in Pivot for and it wasn't there. It was a very small thing, but uh, they've got a huge number of things. You just have to learn how to search right. Mm -hmm. I think Thank it's worth you. it for that. Thanks mm -hmm. for sharing that too, Lauren. Well, we're at the top of the time. So unless someone has a question, we will um, we'll add, a, uh, we'll see if we can find a way to add to this video, the links that we've been recommending so that you, if you, you know, can get to the video or in the announcement, we'll, we'll get put it in the newsletter. We'll find a way to get that information to people. But in the meantime, thank you so much, Mary. This was, as always, enormously helpful. Thank you for, to the people who joined us. And um, we'll start a new round of Get It Done uh, workshops in the spring semester, in the fall semester. So look for our newsletter as Lauren suggested and sign up from the front page and you'll always know what's happening. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.